Hello, can everyone hear me? Shh, shh, shh. It's a library. I know, it's my opening joke. Ha ha ha. Wait, I got to put my spectacles on. I'm sorry. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Texas Tech Friends of the Libraries. I'm Dr. Gerlich. I'm Dean of the University of Libraries. And I want to welcome you on behalf of the Texas Tech Friends of the Library. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're very glad you could be here. The mission of the Friends is to promote the development of and support the services, collections, facilities, and activities of the libraries, as well as to sponsor activities that promote knowledge of and interest in the university libraries, much like tonight's event. It is the hope that through programs like this one and more coming, we will strengthen the relationship between the university, its students, alumni, and the local and surrounding communities. Last year, the Friends brought back a local favorite event, Literary Lubbock, and saw much success in the event's purpose of benefiting the Grover E. Murray Studies in the American Southwest for the Texas Tech University Press. This year, A Night with Authors will again feature four authors from the University of Press, a wine and beer reception, book signing, and catered meal by top tier. So you really want to be here. It's a very glorious event. You won't want to miss this signature event, so be sure to pick up an information card at the sign-in table for event and ticket purchase details. There's also information there for you to consider becoming a friend of the library as well. Members receive membership benefits like discount with University Press and special behind-the-scenes tours of the Southwest Collection Special Collections Library. Now that's a lot of fun. How many of you have ever done that? Oh, just one or two people. It's really very interesting. Our current board of directors is underway with big plans of, for this year's fundraising efforts in addition to Literary Lubbock. So I encourage you to leave your preferred contact address with us at the table so that you'll receive information about our upcoming events and opportunities as well as our newsletter in the fall. Now on tonight's program. The university's libraries is not only about providing books on shelves and research online. A part of the library's mission is to also foster discussion and learning among and between the university and the community. That's why we're very excited to have you here tonight. As you help yourself to your, the refreshments, please also help us in ensuring that we have the best audio and take a moment to silence your phones. You'll be able to view and share the recording we're going to have of the event in a few days' time after we upload it to ThinkTech, the online publishing and archival service that we have. So watch for that link on our Texas Tech Friends of the Library Facebook page. And to continue your learning about Quanta Parker, you should also consider visiting the National Ranching Heritage Center's exhibit, Buckskin and Beads, Native American Clothing and Artifacts artifacts in the DeWitt Mallet Museum. The exhibit, which addresses the unique friendship that developed between Quanup and the Bur Burnett family of the 666646's ranch, and the artifacts that were given to the Burnett family from Quanah and his descendants, can be viewed through August. Now, without further ado, please help me welcome Texas Tech Friends of the Library's President, Marie Meyer Brunges, to the podium. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dean Gerlich. Uh, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce to you Paul Carlson, Emeritus Professor of History at Texas Tech University, and don't worry, I'm not going to read it, everything. He is a, a member of the Texas Institute of Letters and a fellow of the Texas State Historical Association. He has published over 250 articles and essays and 22 books, one of which, Myth, Memory, and Massacre, which is about the stuff we're going to talk about tonight. And it's over on the table over there. It's, it's published by the uh, press, the tech press. 
Okay, tonight, Dr. Carlson invites us to consider whether Quanah Parker, a mysterious West Texas figure, lied about his mother's capture and his father's death. I must admit, I am very curious. So please help me welcome Dr. Paul Carlson. Oh, here. I've read it already. <laughs> thank you, Marie. I need to thank a number of people. Randy Vance in the Southwest Collection and his assistants, Mesh and Caitlin Leonard and Caitlin Garrison and probably some others. Fredonia Paschal, Austin Allison, Connie Aguilar, Ty Kreidler. Curtis Peoples made the maps, as you can see. And then there's Monty Monroe, who thinks he wrote this article. In <laughs> fact, <laughs> he thinks he wrote all my books, including those that were written before he was born. <laughs> listen hard, and listen quick and fast. There's a lot of names, there's a lot of dates, and perhaps a lot of confusion. This speech will last 24 and a half minutes. Check your watch. <laughs> I never knew Quanta Parker. He died more than a quarter of a century before I was born. But I suppose, like the rest of us, he stretched the truth on occasion. Therefore, the question, did Quanta Parker lie, is not a query into a lifetime of comments made by the famous chief. No, it is directed at assertions he made several times, but most famously in Dallas at the 1909 and 1910 Texas State Fairs. In the statements, Quanah said he, his brother Pecos, and his father Peyton Acona were not at the Battle of Pease River on December 19, 1860. Consequently, of course, his father was not killed in the brief, quick, one-sided fight. Federal troops took Cynthia Ann Parker, or Nadua, from her Comanche friends and family during the fight on that cold December morning. And sadly, she never again saw her husband or her two young boys, ages seven, and 11. Think on that one. In brief, here's what happened. On the cold winter morning along Mule Creek, just upstream from its junction with the Pease River in Ford County, 20 federal troops and not more than 20 Texas Rangers and probably 10 and maybe only four surprised and struck a small Comanche hunting camp. The camp contained nine grass tents and approximately 15 people. Most of the people in camp were women and children who, having packed their provisions, were beginning to leave. The fight, or massacre, if you will, was over in 20 minutes. The rangers and troopers killed seven Indians, four women and three men. The rangers captured a boy. Federal troops captured Cynthia Ann and her infant daughter. About six people got away. Again, Quana, who was 11 at the time, said in 1909 and 1910, he was not there. His brother, he said, was not there. His father, he said, was not there and consequently was not killed there. Well, some authors, not that one, but some authors, Whoa, where am I here? Some authors, not that one, <laughs> have labeled the 1909 and 1910 Quanah statements about his brother and his father as lies. In 1972, for example, Robert H. Williams published an article titled The Case for Peyton Acona in Texana, then a quarterly journal. In the article, 
Williams accused Kwana as not being truthful when he, Kwana, said he and his brother were not present and his father did not die in the Pease River Mule Creek fight. S.C. Gwynn also questions Kwana's truthfulness about Pease River. In his 2010 widely read book, Empire of the Summer Moon, quite a few of you, I guess, have read it, Gwen wrote that Robert Williams' article makes a superbly argued case for what Gwen claims, and I quote, is fairly obvious anyway that Kwana's later insistence that he and his father were hunting during the attack is simply untrue. Are Williams and Gwen correct? Or are they perpetuating errors, myth, and falsehoods and in doing so, falsely accusing Quanah Parker of lying. I think the latter. The most significant source of the errors and falsehoods is James DeShield's 1886 book, Cynthia Ann Parker. The book contains an account of the Battle of Pease River, an account DeShield says came from Saul Ross, came from Saul Ross. Both Williams and Gwen rely heavily on DeShields' version of events. DeShields writes that the book's version was Ross's graphic narration of the campaign. DeShields quotes Ross as saying 40, 40 Texas Rangers, not 20, not 10. Texas Rangers and 20 U.S. Cavalry troopers attacked an Indian camp in which Peyton Acona was the leader. Here, more specifically, is what DeShields writes. Remember, DeShields says, says, he's quoting Ross. After a chase of one and a half miles, Ross cut up with Nakona. He shot and killed a young girl who was riding behind the Comanche leader. As the girl was falling from the horse, she pulled Nakona off. A brief fight between Nakona and Ross followed. Ross wounded Nakona, who then leaned against the tree and began to sing a wild, weird song. Then Ross's servant killed the wounded Comanche. DeShields also quotes Ross as saying that Lieutenant Tom Kelleher, remember that name briefly, Lieutenant Tom Kelleher, a Texas Ranger, captured Cynthia Ann. Robert Williams was so confident in the DeShields version of what Ross said about the capture that in his article he wrote, Ross was specific and clear and never changed his story. So, to review, we have Ross saying in 1886, Ross caught Nakona, Ross shot and killed a young girl, Ross wounded Nakona, then he leaned against the tree and sang a weird song, Ross's servant killed Nakona, and Lieutenant Tom Kelleher captured Cynthia Ann. Well, well way back in 1861, in his official report of the fight to Governor Sam Houston, made on January 4, 1861, 14 days after the attack, Ross wrote that Lieutenant M. W. Somerville fought the Comanche chief. He gave no name to the Indian leader whom Somerville fought. He noted that his, Ross's horse, was wounded. He wrote, as De Shields did in 1886, that Lieutenant Kelleher captured Cynthia Ann. Then in 1875, 14 years later, Ross published a letter in Galveston and Dallas newspapers about three weeks apart. Ross called the letter a correct history of the fight at Peace River. In it, he wrote that he fought a Comanche named Mohi and killed him. He made no mention of help from a servant. He made no mention of girl riding double behind Mohi. Clearly, the Ross 1875 correct history of the fight stands in contrast to his 1861 official report and in contrast to what De Shields wrote about what Ross said in 1886. Follow all that? <laughs> That's why I got it on the board. Particularly significant is that in the 1870s, Ross said he killed Mohi and not Peta Nakona. John Henry Brown, boy, I skipped a few, didn't I? Let's go back. This is going to take more than 24 and a half minutes. 
That's Saul Ross, Civil War picture of him a couple years after. John Henry Brown, a Texas politician and historian. In 1875, he had read Ross's correct history letter before it was published in the Dallas newspaper. Obviously, he was privileged to it before editors placed it in the Dallas paper. In any case, in the same edition of the Dallas paper in which Ross's correct history letter appears, there is a letter from Brown pointing out some errors in the correct history. But interestingly, interestingly, Brown did not comment on Ross's statement that he had killed Mohi at Pease River. Killing Mohi apparently was not one of the errors. Brown's take on the whole affair is confusing. Heck, perhaps this presentation is confusing. <laughs> in any case, in 1880, five years after the correct history letter, Ross again altered his story. He was seeking political office by running for a state senate seat. Ross recognized that political benefit could be gained from the fight at Pease River and the capture of Cynthia Ann Parker, who was now, if deceased, famous. So he asked his friend and journalist, Victor Rose, to write a newspaper piece about the events, thinking that it would swell his vote greatly. Now, in 1880, Victor Rose has Ross, rather than Lieutenant Kelleher, capturing Cynthia Ann. There is more. In 1886, when DeShields' book appeared, Ross was running for governor. At that time, Quanta Parker resided on the reservation at Fort Sill in Oklahoma and was a noted Comanche chief. Perhaps killing the father, Pedinacona, of a famous chief, Quanta Parker, rather than Mohi, whoever he was, would serve to swell the Ross vote in the coming election. It may have, he got 73% of the vote, not bad. Clearly, considering the 1861 official report, the 1875 correct history, the reporting in 1880 by Ross's friend Rose and the DeShields 1886 book, Cynthia Ann Parker, we can conclude Ross changed his story several times and Williams is wrong. Now, about the Quanta Parker denials of his father's death in the fight and about Quanta's denials that he and his brother were present. In his Texana article, Robert Williams states, the first denial by Quanta Parker that his father was killed at the Battle of Pease River seems to have been made in an address by the chief in 1896 at, well, Quanta, Texas. Williams dismisses the denial, saying Quanta lied. He also dismisses Quanah's denials made at the two Texas state fairs. He dismisses and rejects them because they were made so long after the 1860 battle. He says Quanah was trying to protect his family's name. From what, I'm not sure. But consider, until DeShields book was published in 1886, that's 23 years after the fight, Quanah had no reason to believe that anyone was claiming his father was killed at Pease River. And therefore, Quanah had nothing to deny. And of course, he didn't. In point of fact, Quanah, much earlier than the 1886 book or the 1896 speech, had said his father was alive after the 1860 battle. Probably the earliest such statement was made to Charles Goodnight, our panhandle uh, friend, during the winter of 1877. 78. We do not know what Quanah said exactly, but clearly Goodnight got the impression that Peyton Acona was not killed at Pease River. Then there is the conversation ten years later, ten years later Quanah had at Fort Sill. After DeShields' Cynthia Ann Parker book appeared, there's <laughs> a that's not a good picture of Charles Goodnight, is it? <laughs> After DeShields' Cynthia Ann Parker book appeared in 1886, it got a lot out of attention and made Ross famous. By at least December 13, people at Fort Sill had been reading and discussing the book. And among those who was there was Marion Brown, daughter of 
John Henry Brown, the historian and politician, and she was visiting the fort and writing letters back to her father. In one of her letters, Marion wrote that in early 1870, 1887, the next month or so, Quana told her his, Quana's father, Pedinacona, was not killed in the battle but died five years later. So, again, until De Shields wrote in 1886 about his father's death at the fight at Mule Creek, Quana Parker had no reason to think that anyone thought his father died at Pease River. There was nothing to deny, and he didn't. The Cynthia Ann Parker biography was a sensation. Not quite as much as uh, Empire of the Summer Moon, but it was a sensation and it made Ross a hero. As noted, it contains errors and misconceptions about the fight at Peace River, about the capture of Cynthia Ann, about the death of Pitanacona. But no one challenged the book's conclusion, at least not in print until after Ross had died. As a result, by the time of the 1909 Texas State Fair, some 23 years after the book was published, almost all Texans accepted DeShields' version of the famous battle that Pete and Acona had died there after a fight with Ross. Quanta Parker did not accept DeShields' version. As noted, as early as 1887, he said the book was wrong, time passed, and he continued to deny his father's uh, death, but no one listened. At the 1909 State Fair, Quanta said, I want to make some Texas history straight up. Some say Saul Ross and Rangers killed my father, Peyton Acona. No, not so. I'd be 11 year old when they capture my mother at Mule Creek fight. She with party of Indians, hunting buffalo, and Yakwa. Yakwa was in command that party. My father with another bunch. Yakwa was killed. So old Indians tell me. Then a year later at the 1910 State Fair, Quanah, in reference to the battle of Pease River, said, no kill my father, he not there. After that, two year, three year, maybe my father sick, I see him die. So I asked, did Robert Williams ignore Quanah's 1877-78 statement to Goodnight? Did he ignore Quanah's 1887 comment to Marion Brown? Both incidents both incidents are contrary evidence to his argument, his thesis, his reason for the article. There is more about Quanah's supposed lies. Williams, in his Texana article, writes the following. It seems highly unlikely that the famous Nakona could just disappear immediately after the battle with no traders, no reservation Indians, no Indian agencies reporting word of him thereafter, not even word of his death. Well, at least two people claim to have seen Peyton Nakona after the battle. Of course, one of them was Quanah Parker, and William said he was lying. But the other, the other was Horace Jones. Jones was the interpreter at Camp Cooper in 1860 when federal troops, not Texas Rangers, federal troops brought Cynthia Ann there after her capture in December. Well, several years later, Jones, who had left the post, stated that back in the fall of 1861 or fall of 62, while he was the interpreter at Fort Cobb, he saw and talked to Peyton Nakona. Nakona had learned that Jones had seen Cynthia Ann at Camp Cooper some years before, well, a year before, and, or maybe two, and Nakona wanted to talk to Jones about her. I mean, that was his wife. They sat in the shade of a large walnut tree and talked. Robert Williams in his article and Sam Gwynn in his New York Times bestseller writes that Quanta lied about his father not being killed. At Pease River, they also write that Quanta lied about him and his brother not being at the site of the fight. As proof of their claims that Quanta was indeed at Mule Creek, both authors quote a statement by Charles Goodnight. Goodnight said that after the battle, he followed the tracks of two Indian horses. The tracks led to a large Comanche camp. Both Williams and Gwen assumed the two riders were the only Comanches who escaped and they speculate that they were Quanah and his brother Pecos. Gwen goes to, so far as to write, 
We also know that two and only two riders survived the fight and managed to get away. For proof, the two riders used comments about the battle from interviews with Texas Ranger Benjamin Golson. Finally, I got it right. Gwen chose a 1928 interview Golson gave to J.A. Rickard. Fair enough, no problem, right? But Gwen ignored portions of the interview where Golson said that he, now get this, Golson and 11 other rangers, Golson said, chased 70 Comanches who were carrying on their horses 32 dead or wounded companions. Well, if that part of the interview was true, some 70-plus Comanches escaped, not two. Williams chose a different Golson interview, one Golson gave to Felix Williams and Harvey Chesley, in 1931. Again, fair enough, no problem. But Williams ignored that part of the interview in which Golson said, now get this, Golson said there were between 500 and 600 Indians in the camp and that the 20 Rangers and 20 uh, federal troops did not kill all of them. We know that after two days of searching, the Rangers, federal troops, and local militia men, who were also there but did not participate in the fight, found seven Indian bodies. We know three were captured, Cynthia Ann, her daughter, and a boy. If Golson is correct about the number of Indians in camp, at least 49 Comanche, 490 Comanches escaped, or maybe 590 Comanches escaped, and not the two that Gwen says. One must, we all must, wonder why Williams and Gwen selected only those parts of the interviews that supported their theses, their arguments. They ignored the contrary evidence. One might also wonder why anyone would use any interview given by Ben Golson concerning the fight at Mule Creek. He wasn't there. <laughs> but he was a Texas Ranger and he was a good storyteller and he got word from others about what happened and embellished it for his family and friends. Conversely, Jonathan Hamilton Baker was there, a member of the militiamen who did not participate in the fight. Baker arrived on the scene a few hours later. They were about four hours behind the federal troops and some of the Texas Rangers. He kept a diary. He was a school teacher. Williams did not use Baker's diary. Gwen did. Gwen, however, did not use the part in the diary where on December 20, Baker wrote, some of the men who came in late say that they trailed some six or eight Indians who made their escape during the fight yesterday. Sergeant John Spengler, head of the 20 federal troops, made a report written on December 24, 1860, five days after the fight. He notes, I regret to state that some of the Indians made their escape. Neither Williams nor Gwen used Spengler's report. It contains contrary evidence. In any event, Contrary to what Gwen says, we are certain that more than two escaped, or more likely, federal troops allowed them to escape. There were women and children. Quana said he was not there and therefore did not need to escape. To, subst <laughs> to, substantiate, to substantiate Quana's claim, there is a December 26, that's seven days later, right? 1860 letter from Captain Nathan Evans. He was in charge at Camp Cooper. He wrote to his superiors in San Antonio. In it, he writes, Cynthia Ann Parker speaks no English. Through the interpreter, what was his name? Jones. I learned that she has two other children with the northern Comanches. Evan's statement indicates that Cynthia Ann knew, she knew that her sons were not at Mule Creek in the Pease River fight. Gwen and Williams did not use this contrary evidence. There is more to the supposed lies, but my presentation is getting a bit long, so just a few more comments. Hold on. To his credit, Saul Ross eventually confessed to errors in the 1886 book on Cynthia Ann Parker. In 1894, when Ross was president of some little agricultural mechanical uh, institution at College Station. <laughs> Susan Parker St. John, uh, a first cousin of Cynthia Ann, came to meet with Ross, and Ross told St. John that federal troops, not he 
and not Lieutenant Kelleher, captured Cynthia Ann. That it was Sergeant Spengler who was about to shoot a woman on horseback when she held out her baby and he chose not to shoot. And that the chief did not sing a death song that day in December 1860. After Ross died, about 1896 or so, some of the Texas Rangers finally, at long last, began to tell their tales and their version of what happened. Ben Golson, of course, was one of them, but he wasn't there. So what, what, do, we, what do we say? Ben, I mean, there were several. Ben Dragoo was another. In 1923, Dragoo, responding to the DeShields Ross account in the famous book, 1886 book, wrote, Someone had a fight at close quarters with the chief. It happened right in the village. There was no long chase. And as to that death song tale, he said, if that chief sang a death song that day, it was after we left him dead. In the, <laughs> in the end, we can say that Ross changed his story several times, that the Shields 1886 book contains errors that have been perpetuated for over 100 years and that Robert Williams and S.C. Gwynn were very often wrong. To conclude, lies have been told about the Battle of Pease River, but Quanta Parker didn't tell them. Thank you very much, Dr. Carlson. Okay, does anybody have any questions? I've got a comment. Um, I have, first of all, I'm, I'm Dr. Jerry Perez. I work for the Texas Tech High Performance Computing Center. And we um, just built a new supercomputer. And uh, the supercomputer's name is Quantum. <laughs> the person who sold it to us is a direct descendant of Mr. Goodnight. His name is Sean Goodnight. And so I don't know if you know how. And the strange thing is, is we named it Quantum before we even knew Sean was related. Yeah. So talk about the weirdness. <laughs> was there another one over there somewhere? No. Oh. My grandmother was a historian, and I remember hearing stories about Quanta Parker and the Buffalo Soldiers from the time I was old enough to remember. But one thing my grandmother always said is that some of these guys never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> and that sure sounds like Mr. Golson to me. <laughs> Dr. Carlson, you need a PR agent to overturn all the bad PR. <laughs> um, I, I work with the Quanta Parker Trail. It's a culture heritage trail that we've created for this area uh, under the auspices of the Texas Plains Trail region. And I cannot tell you how many public presentations we have given where someone brings Gwen's book and we have to bring Myth, Memory, and Massacre and the 1877 Buffalo Soldier Tragedy, your exemplary, well-researched books, to, to try to um, lead the way to a better story and a better, a better real account because of your meticulous research. And we are so grateful to you because all of our work piggybacks off of your good research. <laughs> um, I would just, we have, I grew up in this area, we moved away for 40 years and I'm back now, my husband and I are back in the area and we're starting to read more about this and of course the book that was given to him to read was Gwen's book. So I, I need to, a little just a background on Cynthia Ann, how old was she when she was kidnapped and how old was she when she was, quote, rescued? <laughs> Thirty-four when she was taken by the uh, federal troops. 
So 25 years she lived with Tim. she lost her English and then she came back. Get him, then I'll get you, okay? I had always heard, and I think it was Bill Neely who told me this, that Charles Goodnight was the one who discovered the trail leading to Peter Nakona's camp. So that's sort of the role he played in it, because he was a scout, scouting for the owner. He was a scout with the uh, militiamen, and that's true. He was, uh, they knew the general direction, if you saw the map, the general direction went northwest up the creek, but then Goodnight, if Goodnight is correct, Goodnight discovered the trail that led into the camp. First of all, I appreciate all your research and your books. I think that's very important. But tell me a little bit from a historian's perspective when you put together, I hate to use this word, story like this, but you put together the facts like this, the value of, of the information that was close to the Pease River Massacre and chronologically, and then the things that subsequently came along. And uh, that was one of the great points you made today, that Quanta Parker had no reason to talk about being there or not until about 25 years after the event occurred. I'm not sure how to answer that question. Uh, we dig up the uh, material by hunting through old letters and old documents that were probably not available to uh, Gwen, or they just didn't find them, and to uh, Robert Williams. Uh, so I'm not sure how to reply to the yeah. question, but we just keep digging and digging. Judge Tom Crum is my writing partner on that book, Myth, Memory, and Massacre, and boy, he's the one who really dug through the uh, records before I even came on board, and then I brought I, I suppose I've brought some expertise to it in terms of official records. Why did the militia and the federal troops attack this camp in the first place? Yeah. Well, they, Quanta, I don't know if it was Quanta Parker, but Comanche Indians had, he was only 11, so it wasn't him, paid in Conan. Comanches had attacked some of the areas around Palo Pinto. <coughs> And they had done some real damage. They had killed uh, six people or so, and this was a sort of a re revenge raid. And the governor had asked uh, Saul Ross to put together a uh, group of Texas Rangers from his home county, McClellan County, Waco. He did that. Local militiamen, they all gathered up. And of course, uh, uh, Goodnight was part of that. So was C.C. Slaughter. We know about him out here. He was part of that uh, group. And then the federal troops also were told to join the search to find those Indians who had killed so many people and stolen so much livestock. Uh, and that's why they started out. They rendezvoused uh, at the head of the, what creek, I can't remember what the creek was, and then moved north. Now, who was in charge is a good question. Most people say Saul Ross was in overall charge of the thing, but how can that be? He was a Texas Ranger. He was like 21 years old. Those were mainly Southerners, uh, those uh, Texas Rangers. Federal troops were mainly Yankees. They weren't always going to get along, nor were the militiamen going to get along with some of those. And I don't think the uh, federal troops are going to put themselves under the command of Saul Ross and the Texas Rangers. But in any case, they rendezvoused there, they marched up the creek, hit Peace River, and started going west. And that's when Charles Goodnight found the trail, and they sort of attacked. The, the point, I guess one of the points, is the Federal Troops horses were in pretty good shape. And the Texas Ranger horses were in fair shape. And those who didn't have horses in good shape fell behind. The militiamen, I mean, they had plow horses, for goodness sake, some of them. They fell way behind. So at the time of the attack, most of the Texas Rangers, depending on who you read, <coughs> at least 30 of them, and maybe all but about four of them, were, had fallen behind. And so when the attack came, it was mainly a few of the Texas Rangers and the federal troops. And then the others came up afterwards. 
Well, there's a little more background to that that was going on in the frontier at that time. Uh, Thank you. Uh, John R. Baylor had uh, entered the scene in the 1857-58 and stirred up the frontier against the Indians and, in fact, brought a group up there to attack uh, the uh, Caddo's and others in Palo Pena County. And then the election of 1860 played a somewhat of a role. There, there was a lot of tension in the country at the time because of the election and the talk of war and succession. And so it was just an atmosphere for something to happen, and so uh, the, uh, the settlers, rightfully so, went after whoever they could find after being attacked. But, uh, but yeah, were, uh, yeah, good point, David. Uh, David Murr used to be the uh, director of the Southwest Collection. Uh, yeah, there was a lot going on. That election 1860 got Abe Lincoln, a Yankee, uh, in the uh, White House, and the Southerners were opposed. As David said, people were already Texas had it yet, but. Many states had already seceded, and so we got federal troops and Texas Rangers, local militiamen, got all these Indian attacks, and John R. Baylor, he, he was a sorry son of a gun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were two reservations established up in that area, one for the Comanches and one for a whole group of other Indians, and he wanted those reservations closed. And so he, as David said, he stirred up all kinds of trouble. Any other questions? One more. Okay. One more. Um, taking your research and the meticulous way you put together a story, uh, we have found in trying to piece together local, regional landmarks and events that happen here that you have to get the story from a variety of sources. And on that note of Baylor, um, we had found that in uh, R.G. Carter's On the Border with Mackenzie book, uh, he talks about a renegade West Point cadet that was kicked out of West Point and was heard and rumored to be rampaging on the frontier out in this area of West Texas. Well, then another book we were given was John Erickson of Hank the Cowdog fame, <laughs> who wrote his story, his family story, called Prairie Gothic. And Mrs. Sherman, who was one of the white settlers who had been injured severely and brutalized in one of these allegedly Comanche attacks on the uh, Texas frontier in the area you speak of, Palo Pinto and Throckmorton and those areas, she admitted to her family before she died as a result of this brutal attack that the man who had raped her was blue-eyed with red hair. And what John Erickson was able to piece together, being that this was one of his family relatives, was the fact that this might be the same renegade West Point cadet who was out in this area um, launching some of the depredations disguised as an Indian. So there's a lot of stuff that was going on, and we may never really know the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but we just all do the best we can. There's no question. Texans and Kansas people were stealing horses and cattle from the reservations as often as Indian people were, were uh, stealing horses and cattle from white settlers. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlson. And thank you all for coming. We really, we really appreciate it. And if you'll leave your name, as Dean Gerlich said, we'll see that you get information about any other events. Thank you all. Good evening.